you're winning awards for abuse and torture and you're literally broadcasting it to the world and nobody knows because of how manipulative you are and because of the fact that you just silence everyone through threat after threat after threat of things that no normal person would go up against after you have traumatized them it's awful we have to we have to get changed and we have to drive are you going through life blind This is Eyes Wide Open with Nick Thompson. On this podcast, we share knowledge and stories that build human connection while elevating stigmatized societal issues such as mental health, holistic wellness, culture, free speech, and more. All to ensure we show up in the world with our eyes wide open. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of Eyes Wide Open. Today is a... It's a it's a heavy episode. Um, today I have Brittany Curran Hatch on as a guest. She was on America's Next Top Model season eight back in 2007. And to the surprise of probably absolutely no one, the treatment of the cast of that show, uh, specifically that season we'll get into today, uh, was completely exploited, mistreated. Um, their mental health was used against them and weaponized. That was 16, 17 years ago. And we're still dealing with the same type, if not worse, of exploitation, legal ramifications and threats based on contracts that are confusing, not accurately representing people, um, no mental health support during or after the show. And uh, Ms. Hatch is truly a, a strong survivor and has been through so much and we recently uh, connected through the UCAN Foundation, and she was sharing with me some of the experiences that she's had, um, you know, obviously doing the show, post-show, but really the trauma that the show has done to her and people in her life, other cast members, it's really, it's damaging. And people are getting severely hurt mentally and physically, which you'll hear about in today's episode but um this has to stop we have to band together we have to allow people to share their stories and we need to force change in reality tv production because it needs to be produced ethically we can't continue this way Uh, it is ruining people's lives so i hope that watching today's episode hearing ms hatch's story will help you look at reality TV, the production, and what you see on screen with your eyes wide open. Today, we have Brittany Corinne Hatch, who is a mother, entrepreneur, children's book author, model, and 2007 contestant on America's Next Top Model, uh, or maybe she's a America's Next Top Model survivor. Welcome to the show. Hi, um, thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm glad to have you here. So um, before we dive into your experience on America's Next Top Model, which is what, 15, 16, 17 years ago now. Um, yeah, and it's amazing how long it's been. Yeah, it's amazing how nothing has changed in reality TV production right. over the course of this time as well. But absolutely. Yeah, before we get into that, I always like to ask people, what did you want to be when you were growing up? And how did that change and lead you to where you are now? Um, I don't know that it changed that much. I wanted to be uh, a writer, an actress. Um, my two, like my, literally my two um, high school superlatives were I want to make a movie and I want to write a book. Um, Those so, were mine too in high school. That's really funny. Yeah. But with a, <laughs> I think a Ryan Adams quote that was, um, when I sell out, I'm going to sell out all kinds of sold out and it's going to be great. <laughs> well, I, and I did, yeah. right? I went on reality television. I sold out big time. That's so funny because I, you know, I was voted in eighth grade most likely to be famous, but it was going to be because I was a going to be a pro wrestler, or it was going to be because I was going to be president, or I was going to be a filmmaker. But like all of those things are like creative and for my ideas, not for me. Except mm-hmm. maybe you could argue the WWE thing would be for me. But the mm-hmm. funny thing about that is, like. It's almost like it's a parrot. My life's a parody of itself because I go get famous then on reality TV for my relationship, which is such a, a, a weird thing to be known for and or for, right. you know, your experience on 
um, an America's Next Top Model too. So, so you wanted to be an actress, and then you became a reality TV star, and you were a model. So, so I did model afterward. Um, I was actually when I was like fourteen, my mother had taken me to New York and signed me with Elite. And I told her I wanted nothing to do with an industry so vain. <laughs> and then I got to be like 21. And I was like, wait, somebody would pay me maybe to take my picture. I think I could be okay with that. Um, and my friend convinced me to go to this casting because I'm 5'11". So every time I walked in a store, the girl would be like, you should be a model. And she's like, if mm. you go and try out for this, I will never, ever, 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 ever say anything to you about it again. And I was like, all right, fine. So I went and tried out and they called me back. Wow. And that was the show? Yeah. What was the tryout like? The tryout was very strange. So the first part of the tryout thing is you go and you wait in this huge long line because it was, I mean, it was an enterprise that everybody wanted to do it. How many seasons were they in at that point? It was already like we six were on or seven, eight, right? So they do two a year because they spit them out that fast and then just roll them over. Um that's <laughs> so yeah we were cycle eight we were the last cycle that was allowed to smoke cigarettes as well because we smoked so many cigarettes um that they took that privilege away for future contestants who they did not warn beforehand um so that was fun for some of the future people uh and they sort of said to us they're like we can't tell you not to smoke but we'd really like it if you didn't smoke as much because we don't want to look like we're promoting smoking. So of course, every time we had a conversation, the first thing we did was light up a cigarette. Of course. <laughs> and they would let that happen on film too, right? Because mm -hmm. that was right around the time that actually, I don't remember when you really couldn't smoke anywhere anymore. Was that like around that time or? I think sort of ish. Okay. Like it's, it varied depending on the state you were in. I think at that time, right. like, Right. I mean, I'm in the South right now, so you can, we're in Georgia, so you can still smoke in bars. You can, as long as they don't serve food, like it's, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. There's one bar here and I'm not going to sell them out. There's one bar in Chicago. There's probably more than one. There's one that I know of where people still smoke and it is, it is just like, you can tell they've been smoking in there for like 50 years. Like yeah, I, I think I know which one you're talking about because I lived in Chicago for a little while. And then yeah. they have those, that weird, like they have that weird liquor law where like some bars can be open like New York hours, but yeah. other bars can't. It's very strange. Never yeah. And it's all very weird. And here you can buy alcohol at like a 7-Eleven. Yeah. It's so weird. You can get it like anywhere. I, I'm always like surprised when I go to some place like Georgia because you you can only buy beer and wine at, at um, grocery, at stores, the grocery right? stores, right? Yeah, yeah, but you can't so, buy hard. Liquor. And then they have like the weird Sunday laws where like mm. you know those, which was the same thing like when I lived up in Maine, those you know Bible County laws where you can't buy alcohol between these hours on this day because that makes perfect sense for any reason. Just at the specific time, you can't have it. Right. It's so weird that those state laws like that are so weird to me. I remember I was in, I think it was Pennsylvania and I went to go, um, I was there for a work trip and I went to go like grab some uh, alcohol for a like mm -hmm. little party. Some of us were going to have, and, um, I couldn't find it. I didn't realize you had to go to like a liquor store to mm -hmm. get it. And there's I only a few grew of them. Up, um, outside of Philly. So, oh, okay. Yeah. This was outside, just outside of Philly. Very interesting. So, so you decided to go try out, you had never modeled before and you were 21 years old. Oh, wow. Old. So they really, um, so, okay. So you, you said I'd that. I'd also uh, never seen the show. Like I, I'd never right. watched it. I think I was the one girl that had never watched it and I had no idea. Like I just, I, I've never really watched television very much. I liked to like make movies and stuff. When I was in high school, yeah. we had this terrible TV show on like the local network that was called Springfield live on tape, which was the worst thing ever. Um, <laughs> yeah. I always found like watching TV makes me not do other things because it allows me to procrastinate. And if I let myself get bored, then oh. I'll do something. That's smart. You know, I, I don't, you know, it's really hard actually sometimes like working from home and stuff to not just have the TV on, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I really, 
really have like stopped watching as much TV and movies as I used to. And it's not because I don't think it's, I think it's a bad thing. Like, I think it's great to enjoy entertainment. Like I like to, to produce stuff and, and, and things like that. But like, I just felt like I would find myself like binging entire shows over the course of a day or two. And it's like, what else could I have been doing? Why couldn't I just enjoy that one or two episodes a night? That's the other reason that I can't seem to do it because like with my ADHD, I like hyperfixate. And then I'm like, where the hell did the entire go? go? And I got nothing. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, man. So you were, so you went and auditioned basically so that you couldn't, so that you wouldn't get cast and your friend would leave you alone. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And then you did get cast. What was the casting process like? Um, So the casting process, uh, initially, like we went through that whole thing and then they flew us out to LA. Um, They put us up in a hotel. It's kind of really fuzzy because like everything happens really fast and you kind of don't really know what's going on. Um, I remember like they put us in a room at one point with like all the producers and casting director people and they were like, all right, so... If you want to be here, if you want to stay, you have to be outgoing. You got to fake it to make it. That was their favorite phrase. Fake it to make it. Um, Hmm. And then we would like go to these things, fill out like paperwork and legal things. And then we met with two different psychiatrists. Oh, interesting. So back then they were still weaponizing a psych evaluation. Oh, yeah. Um, They actually, there's another season of it, which I read where a girl mentioned in her um like psyche valve that she because they ask you if you have any phobias right Mm -hmm. that she was terrified of um large insects because of an incident that had happened when she was younger and they had her literally do a shoot with a tarantula like on her face what the why would somebody do that to somebody who revealed that to them i mean the apa tells you that using phobias as torture tactics is unethical, immoral, and illegal. So how these people providing this information to these networks are allowed to have licenses is beyond me. Yeah, there's um, there's complete companies that provide these psychological and mental health services, and I'm using air quotes mm-hmm. for those of you listening. So they, there's like a whole, a whole industry there where they're – they're basically taking someone who's taken this this vow to follow the APA guidelines, um, you know, and, and code of ethics, and they're basically abandoning that to learn someone's triggers, learn someone's phobias, learn some learn someone's Absolutely. insecurities, and then give that to production so that they can exploit those people. And I can't believe yeah. they were even doing it to the extent I mean, of the tarantula. I tried to get my records actually. Um, they and said no, right? Like two I, years ago. Oh, they said no. So I found the one. Sign that away. Smacked her down, like been verified. I was like, all right. Hi, I was a contestant on America's Next Top Model. She's like, how are you doing? And I was like, I'm good. Uh, I was wondering if I could get my medical records. Um, and she was like, I, it, I'm it, i actually not in town right now, but I would have to talk to CBS about that. So um, let me get back back to you and then i messaged her two more times and then you know how like when somebody blocks you the thing goes from like blue yeah. To green yeah every text after that i got green 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 i tried to call the number and it was like this person is not accepting calls at this time wow. and i was like you friggin blocked me wow because i requested my medical records how dare i well they outright told jeremy that he signed away his right to his records in his contract for love is blind <laughs> so we're we're working on that because i think if we get a um, a legal course, because according to HIPAA, you can't withhold medical records from someone. Right. So unless, unless they found some weird loophole roundabout way to say that that wasn't technically a, a medical examination, well, which would be ludicrous, then right. we're all entitled to these. Yeah. It's, and I mean, I think it would reveal quite a bit if they had to share them. Yeah. So when you when you first got there, they put you all in hotel rooms. What was it like? Did they isolate you? Did they allow uh, you to interact yeah, with we one were, another? No, we were isolated in hotel rooms. We didn't get like a key to our hotel room or anything like that. They basically like they went through all our stuff. They took all our stuff. Um, Did you? They take your ID and, and all that they, stuff too? Absolutely. Yeah. And I had to think about that before and try to like remember if they mm-hmm. had taken my ID. 
And I was like, did they or didn't they? Because I feel like they did. And then, so I have this memory of JL and I in Australia, who was uh, another contestant on the show. When we got kicked off, they also sequester you. So you have to go back and like stay in a hotel room and remain there and do the job that you were doing before, but you're not in the competition anymore. You just got to show up to the stuff, but not talk to anybody so that if there's ever an audience present or like crew present, nobody knows who might have been the winner. So you're still there for no reason, just for like months. So we snuck out because we were like, fuck this shit. Well, yeah. And and then they can edit you out of order too. If there is a scene where you're in later, even though you're eliminated, but they can use it to drive that storyline. Yeah. So we snuck out and we met these two kids on the street and they're like, where do a gay guy and a street guy go to have fun? And JL being JL is like, come with us. We're looking for the fun too. So we wandered (laughs) off with these kids into the night. Um, And then we all ended up back at like our hotel room hanging out. But between that, we'd gone to a bar and the only bar we could actually go to was the bar that this kid worked at because we didn't have any identification. We didn't have any IDs or money. And I was like, that's right. We didn't have those things. We were not given those back. They took them away. And it's. Doesn't that I mean, feel dangerous just they in even general? Like, our clothes, like anything that had a label on it or anything because they don't want to promote anything yet. They mm-hmm. have to greet it. Um, our mail got gone through anything that anyone sent us. Like they went through everything first. Um, what? It's like being a prisoner. Yeah. Jeez. I can't. How long did you film? We filmed for a about two and a half months. <gasps> what were you allowed to talk to friends or family or anything during that time? Not really. We had so we had a list of like pre approved people who had signed a contract, like an NDA. Okay. Um, and there was intermittent times where like they would be like, You're allowed phone time for ten minutes and you would have to like compete for that 10 minutes with the other girls because there was like this little room in the house where there was a phone and there was this thing when you would pick up the phone it would be like this is a recorded phone call blah 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 because they have to say that in california if they're recording um but yeah you can only talk to like those two or three people 10 minutes a week if that if you get that special phone time um that's literally like prison you you get one phone call in there before you have to go do something else because everybody runs a little bit over and, and like, you know, arguments over or whatever, because they're trying to facilitate drama. Right. What was it like on set for you? Like food, water? Did you have any, cause I know on love is blind. We had a lot of, <laughs> despite what you might see, we did not have access to food and water. So on set we, so it was weird for us because our living arrangement, like we actually did live in a house, but our groceries and stuff for ourselves, like, on our days in the house where they would film, which was maybe like a day here or a day there when we weren't out doing stuff um, or on set, wherever it would be. Um, We had to like call the back phone with our $34 a day per diem that we got. And (laughs) that was what we got to buy groceries with and be like, make a list and be like, can you go pick me up this please? And then things would just drop. We had smart water readily available in the house because it was promoted by the show, which we thought was hilarious because, you know, smart water for models. Um, we were like, are you guys trying to, like, make a joke here? Yeah. Very nice. That's kind of kind of crazy. Yeah, and then when you snuck out, by the way, did they find out that you oh, snuck yeah. out? Big okay. time. What was so that we, like? Because we were threatened, basically, like, if you leave your room, you don't have a key, you have to come to the producer to get a key, mm-hmm. you're in trouble. So we had put tape over the door. Okay. And the tape came off the door. So we had to go to the front desk and get mm-hmm. a room key. And so the next day, um, and one of these kids goes off to work and the other kids hanging out in our hotel room and we're just having a conversation because we've been so socially isolated that speaking to another human being is like, freaking amazing you're just like this is you're a person you're another person and we actually went out into society and you're just like shell-shocked um so we hear a knock on the door and this kid's like oh fuck and we're like oh fuck so he runs and he hides in the shower (laughs) Um, and production comes in and they sit us down on the bed and they're like we need to talk to you where did you guys go last night and we were like we don't know what you're talking about and they were like where did you we know you left like, you feel like you're, like, some kid caught yeah. in trouble. Like, you feel like you're, like, 10 years old. Where did you go? We know you left. We didn't go. And, and finally, like, I just, I started crying. And I was like, 
I went and I made a call to my mom and I like, cause I didn't know what to say. I was terrified yeah. of them. And they're like, yeah. pack your bags. You're going home now. You're on the next flight. They ended up, so they flew us home, which <laughs> God forbid they flew us home, right? They let us go. That's a punishment. Yeah, you out. got out. Um, and they flew two other girls that had already been eliminated to take our place. And they also told us at the time, they were like, you're losing all your pu publicity, everything like that, which they obviously didn't do. Um, but it was just like threat after threat after threat. And well, like, that's all they have. Yeah. All they have is we're going to, we're going to, you're going to lose your fame. You're going to lose your publicity. How did they find out that you snuck out? Was it the front desk selling you out? Yeah. Yeah. Because of the room key. And then I remember, cause we smoked cigarettes up there because we were smokers and we couldn't like leave our room. Mm -hmm. Literally could not leave without the babysitter like during the day. And we're just in there for like 15 hours and we had like two cigarettes. We got charged. I got charged a smoking fee and had to pay like the $250 <laughs> to the hotel. That's unbelievable. Because I was locked in a room for like a week and a half. I just like, it's such a, there's so much psychological damage going on when you're a isolated mm -hmm. B uh, just from humans B you're isolated from your friends and family and your support yeah. system. C the, you're not allowed to even really build a, a genuine relationship with the people you're filming with because you're not allowed to talk to them when you're not filming right? because they want to capture all of that. So and being on ice. Oh God. That's like judging days. We sat in a room on ice for up to like 16 hours. And you're like, oh, you're not God. deliberating this for friggin' 16 hours. And they would bring like one meal in. They wouldn't let you go to the bathroom. You'd be like, can I, I really got to pee. Can I, can I pee? Can I go for a cigarette? And they tell you no. And you're like, mm -hmm. do you want me to piss my pants? Like, what, what do you want to happen here? What is this control over? What is the point? What am I going to possibly see between here and the sound stage on my way to the bathroom with an escort? Nothing. And also exactly. for those of you who are listening, being on ice means you're there, you're present, but you can't speak to one another. So to be put on ice for six hours when you're in a room full of people, um, that's pretty, that's pretty, uh, that's a high, that's a hard ask. Uh, and I, I remember like being, we were put on ice in the car. We were put on ice, um, going back and forth. We were put on ice when we first arrived and got, and mm -hmm. we're eating lunch at separate tables. Exactly. And you have to remember, like, you don't have anything to entertain yourself with. You don't have a phone. You don't have a, sh like, you can't throw on the TV. You don't have a newspaper article to read. You literally are sitting there in silence with nothing to do but stew in your head. Mm -hmm. And, like, wait patiently while you shut the hell up with, like, your head down and just, like, literally just sit there and stare at a wall like a child in detention who did something wrong or a person in prison. Yeah, that's exactly it. What do you, what toll did that take on you? It, I mean, when I remember like there are times when I got back to the real world, um, where like simple things, like I started bartending again because you have to, you can't, so you have like a no compete in your contract. You can't work mm -hmm. at all or talk about it before the show airs. And there's like that yeah. whole thing, which, how are you not an employee if there's a no compete? But um, so like, I'd be like behind the bar and like to my manager, I'd be like, can I go to the bathroom? And he'd be like, you can just, you're, why are you asking me? You're an adult human being, just go. And be like, oh, right, um, I can do that. That's okay. And then like, I think I probably drank a lot afterward like a lot too much in readjusting to everything mm -hmm. um especially after everything aired because then there was that whole thing where like i became the crybaby of the season even though i am usually not like the sort of person who cries and never had been everyone's like that's you i don't get it um probably more so now now i'm much, much more emotional per a person but uh it's um i just sort of like and I got like super sensitive to like being in public spaces because of that. And like mm. worried about like what people were saying. And I mean, some of the things people say are fucking awful because they no longer They're see insane. you as like a human being. No. And you're like, you wouldn't talk to somebody like that over crying in real life. You'd be like, what's the matter? 
Well, and the reality is too, is you could have easily cried less than everybody else, but they just decided to keep the clips of you crying in because they were seeing an opportunity to make a character out of you. Absolutely. And there's, and I mean, I even feel like with questions and leading in the way that they conduct like their interviews on the fly Mm -hmm. and whatever else, when they have you there, they're saying things like, they're like, so do you feel like so-and-so did this, but can you phrase it like it's happening right now? And, Mm -hmm. or I remember the first day we got there, right? So when we get picked for the house, we get to the house and there are 13 of us girls and there are 12 beds because they want a drama. And I was Mm -hmm. like, I don't give a fuck. I will sleep on the couch outside. And JL was like, I'll go sleep on the couch outside with her. And like in our next day interviews where they like take you to the sound stage and you have to wear the same outfit every time you go do this for because they want to splice it up. And that's and OTFs like, are on the flies. For those of you who don't know, that's when, when you see someone like basically talking to the camera about what's going on, that's an OTF or on the fly interview. And they always make you wear the same outfit. Mm-hmm. You have to um, answer the same questions. You have to reword things. You have to speak in the present tense. You have to always wear always. the same outfit. Can you yeah. That again in the present tense. And with, they also had us, for us, we also had to do confessionals. So we had to go sit in like this little mm-hmm. isolated room for 30 minutes a day and stare at a camera. And it didn't matter if we talked or not. We had to be in that room. For And it was like this little tiny, like it was like a closet like this big. Where you just like, like you solitary click the button confinement. on the it, it is exactly like that. And it's weird when you start to Jeez. think about like, you start to, if you read like the psychological reports on like, mind control and interrogation Mm -hmm. techniques and things like that it's legitimately like a guide of how to re like run a reality show and how to break the human spirit that you just after going through the experience you sit there and you're like what the fuck it took me until last the end of last year to actually start processing this stuff. And it wasn't until I like, I, I had made the decision. I'm like, I'm done with this. Like I have my, I have a following. I'll talk to them. I don't care about gaining more. I don't care about talking about reality TV. I don't care about anything. I just want to be back in my normal life. And <clears throat> it started to clear in my mind when that happened. And I'm like, wait a minute. The fact that they took every individual identity piece of me with my wallet, with my ID, with my passport, my phone, my connectivity to anything, and then just shoved me in a hotel room and told me I couldn't leave without permission. And the only time you could get permission was to go spend 30 minutes in the gym or 30 minutes at the pool. And this is, you know, when we're in the pods. Yeah. Well, there, yeah, that was, they, they claimed you could have that. I think I got to go to the gym once and I know I got to go to the pool once. Uh, because I, I sunburned. <laughs> I mean, we had a pool where we lived, so I can yeah. say like our living conditions weren't terrible, but. So were you allowed to roam freely and stuff in that house or? or... It, when we were in the house, when we were in the house, we were allowed to like do whatever we wanted, but we were always mic'd up. Um, we, I remember at one point played like hide and seek with the camera crew because we were really friggin' bored. Um, <laughs> and we started using like gibberish, like get a guy, get a gink, get a get, get a goo, get again, get a guide over there. And they're like, what are they doing guys? Like they, we don't understand. Like they're on their walkie talkies with production. Like what's happening. Do you want us to humor them? Do you want us to keep filming? Like, what are we supposed to do in this situation? And I guess they told them to keep filming. Um, of course they lost JL cause she managed to find like one corner of the house under a pile of clothes. And she just stayed there for like six hours. And production started freaking out because they had no idea where she was. And they were like, did she leave? Like, what is happening? Um, And they aired like half the fights that we staged in order to distract the crew so that we could run and hide in places because we were really bored. Um, As like real fights, we're like, that's not how that happened. Like we were joking. It was, it was literally us faking this. And they make it seem like this big dramatic, like, we're like, that's, Oh, we were like kids locked in the worst for like rehab summer camp of hell. Oh my gosh. I mean, I don't know what else to compare it to. <laughs> you know, there was a, there was a scene in love is blind where Danielle and I are in costumes and we are mm-hmm. having in real life, the most tongue in cheek conversation about the costumes and this, this stuff. Cause like, we didn't want to keep talking about the same things over and over that they keep trying to drum up drama with. And, yeah. um, 
even even in the show they we stopped filming we finished the scene and then i stood up and i took it was hot in there so i stood up i took the corn costume off and they made it seem like with dramatic music and very choppy editing that we were having a legitimate argument and then the dramatic yeah. music and then they get me where we're already done filming or at least i thought taking the costume off because i was hot mm -hmm. i mean it's just they and then you're mic'd the entire time yeah. so they could take anything you say on mic and Frank invited into a scene and Frank inviting is when you take something that is said um, out of context or in a different it. scenario and then make it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's just crazy that you, you guys were just mic'd all the time. How many hours yeah. a day were you filming or mic'd? I should I mean, say maybe. Usually up to 20 or more. Mm -hmm. um, when we were on set, like we would still be mic'd when we were in the cars, when we were in hair and makeup. Oh, wow. um, when we were on challenges when we were on ice uh they would take our mics off at night but then if we started to dare talk again um i mean there's it's surveillance central there's a camera Jesus. in every freaking corner so you guys actually there. stayed in the house together. yeah and there's a camera okay. like literally everywhere again thank you so much for sharing your story because i know it's a you know, it, it's hard. Like whenever yeah. I have to, when I shared it with you a couple of weeks ago or what was that last week? I don't know. The days are all the same to me now. You know, that was, it was hard. It kind of put me in a funk mm -hmm. and it, it made me feel, you know, certain kind of ways. I couldn't wait to pour a drink. Like it really does get you to the point where you're all like yeah. in that heightened state it's again. Taken like 17 years for me to even be able to talk about it. And it started with the Oliver Twix interview and one of the other cast members, Renee, who is now in prison serving a second term um, because she's she went through hell. And then they put her on another reality show after that that Tyra produced, um, which is just mind blowing how much they ruined this person's life. Um, she had like sent me a message on social media it was just like, I'm really sorry for everything, whatever else. And she had been a good friend of my friend, JL, who had just passed. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, don't worry about it, whatever. And I sort of like, I was trying to think of how to respond appropriately. And I reached out to Sarah and we started talking about some of it. And like the fact that she was still in prison and the fact of like JL's death and everything JL went through. And we were like, what happened to us was really messed up. And we've mm -hmm. shut it down and not talked about it for so long that like we didn't realize. And even my then um fiance now my ex but he was like it's weird to hear you talk about it because literally for the past four years anytime anyone's like aren't you that girl that was you're like yeah it, it's a thing that happened yeah and that's a coping mechanism too yeah i know other reality contestants that i've known for years from different shows and we've never discussed our experiences because you push it down so far especially the one like the longer you're on it the worse it gets and then yeah. the bigger the show is the worse the aftermath is and it doesn't go away and we didn't have at that time the same sort of social media platforms that exist now like there was like myspace and facebook kind of um so we didn't really have a voice to combat anything that was being shown or said other than the press interviews that they booked for us and we were not allowed to do other interviews. Yeah, I think that's something people don't really understand. It was the same for Love is Blind um, where you couldn't do any press that wasn't offered to you from the show, from production, mm -hmm. or you had to run it by them before yep. going on any other show or doing any other interviews. They, they own everything about you. And that's one of the things in the contract. And I, I do wanna ask you about your contract and I wanna talk yeah. about like what happens to you after the show, like being in the public eye. But, um, you know, in the contract, I had to have it amended at one point because I was a VP at a software company and I was the evangelist of our product. So yeah. I had to do podcasts. I had to do interviews. I had to do, um, yeah, you know, I, I say media, but like, you know, B2B media. And they said, I, it said in the contract, I wouldn't even be able to do that. So I had to have that amended. And then, mm -hmm. Even like when you were to like when I started my podcast and stuff, like there's so many rules about what you can and can't do, mm -hmm. which is just it, it's they literally own you and yeah. they don't pay you. So you mm -hmm. don't make you don't make money 
off of the residuals. You don't make money doing these interviews and promoting the show that's making them billions of dollars. Exactly. And I think about now, like all the extra work that we did when we weren't competing because they have, sure, they say it's a competition. I still, my speculation, and I think everybody's speculation that was on it, um, is that it's pretty much rigged from the start. Yeah, with Love is Blind, they had peep, they had personas cat, they had personas decided and they just needed to cast to those. And I remember too, even for me, like when my, um, the CEO of the company I worked at when the show came out, he yeah. actually saw it. He saw the preview on YouTube or somewhere and was like, I was super nervous because I wanted to make sure that like you were the person that I thought you were. And, right. and that when I watched it back and this was after the show and he, he said all this, he's, when I watched it back, he's like, and I saw the same Nick on TV that I know in real life. And he's like, and I told him, I'm like, that's not the case for everyone. Like some people get, yeah. get these nasty edits and you know what they've done on love is blind to uh, Trisha and to Shayna and, you know, in others, what they did to Jackie in the last season, they just, they just put together these, these scenes and these storylines that don't represent reality in so many of the cases. Did you have yeah, any of those where you were, aside from the crying, where you were just completely misrepresented? I, I did. I am. Um, so on our go sees, uh, at that point, even, I think just even talking to like other people other than who we had been with for so long was strange. Um, and we had to go to these ghost season. I was like super nervous. Um, I'm, I'm naturally a really introverted person. Um, mm -hmm. and we had just done this, uh, commercial type thing where we had to use cue cards and I was run over by a car when I was 17. Mm -hmm. Um, it almost killed me. I had five pelvic fractures oh my, my acl was torn i had eight staples in my head um i don't remember the day at all it doesn't exist for me i woke up mm. in a hospital bed uh, i came out of my I'm shoes so you actually come out of your shoes when you get hit by a car i got hit by a jeep doing 50 trying to beat a red light oh. um i'm lucky to be alive they told me i looked because i am as tall as i am so it hit my hip instead of my intestines um i was in rehabilitation for like most of my junior year at DuPont Children's Hospital. Uh, and they test you a year afterward and they tell you like, here's our baseline. We're trying to figure out if you lost anything. And they're like, intelligence wise, you score way up here. We don't know if you've lost anything because your grades, because I had undiagnosed ADHD are from C's to honors classes. So we don't really have a baseline. Um, but your short term memory is down here and that's your working memory. So mm. I could not do the challenge. Like I could not look at a cue card and remember what I had read five seconds later when I looked at the camera and it was very emotional for me to like go through that and realize that it like still impacts me that bad because it's not just like, I, I know that I lose everything. I lose my keys. I lose my everything every day, all the time. Um, both between ADHD, which has a working memory problem and that brain injury and it mm -hmm. never gets fixed. So I was already sort of upset with that. Um, and I remember I was, for some reason, one of the producers was like with me on go sees. And I talked to some of the girls about this, like afterward. And I was like, did you guys have anybody other than camera crew with you? And they were like, no, I was like, well, that's bizarre. So, you know, there's a lot of speculation there, but, um, mm -hmm. I remember like, I, feel like I had told, and again, my memory is what it is. So it's possible that I'm wrong, but I feel like I told the cab driver to meet me over at like on Cooper street in the thing. And I, we were so sleep deprived. We had just gotten to Australia, which is a totally different, different time zone. We had already been sleep deprived for months. Um, and we're doing this thing. I just had had that happen. And I was like, I'm, I'm going home. Like they're going to kick me off. And I, I like, I was completely lost, which is scary. Mm -hmm. Like, and there's people there, but they're not going to help you. You know, Do like, you think they were just, like, exploiting you and your brain injury. Yeah, basically. And then it's made into, and then they aired it and showed it as like, I like literally I'm having an emotional breakdown. Like when somebody reacts that way, that's not a normal reaction. And that means that there's something else going on 
at that time for that person. Yeah. And for me, like I, I lost it. I just, I was so overwhelmed and for years and years. And I mean, still to this day, I still hear shit about that. And it's like, that was five seconds of my life. What did they make it look like? Like I was just some crazy cry bitch. Jeez. I'm so sorry. And like you said, that's a couple minutes. It's just literally a couple minutes and they use it to define your entire existence. And it affects everything like it because everybody can Google you the second they meet you and it yeah. never goes away. Like there are, and they re-air this show so often because it was such an enterprise. Like people, even my friends, and they say it jokingly and I love them for it. But they'll be like, yeah, you're crying in my living room right now. And I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> how's that? <laughs> so sorry, so sorry. And they're like, no, okay, and I'm just teasing you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I when I signed with my agency in New York, um, I didn't even like mention top model. I sent out Polaroids like I would have done it had I never gone on the show because I was mm -hmm. so humiliated. Mm. I'm so sorry. And you, you, are you okay? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I wish I could give you a hug. No, it's, <laughs> it's just awful. Like you don't deserve to be treated that way. You don't deserve to be misrepresented when you're, you know, just doing the best you can in the situation you're in, which is an extreme situation. That's one thing I don't think people really understand about these shows is it isn't a documentary crew following you around with your every move. No. You are deliberately put into manufactured situations while you've been sleep deprived, while you've been um, starved. That's when you're why they sleep deprive you. They want you to be at your most volatile. Mm -hmm. They want, that's why you're not allowed to talk. That's why you're not allowed to like, reach out to your support system. And for me, like JL, she had been my support when like her and I were really close on the show. She was the one person that like I connected with. Um, and she got kicked off right before that. And I just, I, I lost it. And I like, now I look back and I can laugh at it because it's been 20 years. And like the other girl's response was like, some people have wars in their country. And I'm like, that's a very valid response to somebody that is having a meltdown <laughs> because it's true, but also over judging somebody for five seconds of like when they're at their worst in the worst situation, just trying to like function yeah. is just, it's cruel. Why do you think, and this kind of gets to the online stuff, which you did, you had a different experience because social media wasn't so prominent. Yeah. What do you, what do you want to say to people? And, and I do it. I'm, I'm getting snarky in the comments and, and, you know, I used to be very reactive and I'm very sarcastic. Um, so mm -hmm. I can be very snarky when I'm not checking it, you know? And I, yeah. but like, what do you, people that are cruel, people that are judging you based on what they see in a reality TV show, what? What do you want to like? What would you say to them, or what have you said to them? Initially, I just sort of used to shut down and not want to talk about it. Um, now, I think my skin has gotten so thick because of it mm. that I'm like, literally, nothing in the world could embarrass me or upset me because I was laughed at by multiple countries over no. five seconds of my life that has followed me for twenty years, like. I that's what I got. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, screw you guys. I really don't care. It's so um, it's so sad though that that's the experience that had to toughen you up or yeah. give you tough skin. And that that's you know it's that people have to go through that and it the bullying especially in a show where like there are things that you read because they're it's based on your appearance number one mm -hmm. and women get a lot more of that even on the shows like you did like oh well she's oh, this yeah. or she's that and people are just people are just downright cruel people diagnose like wh who are you like who are you to yeah. say someone has don't you love how some... like because somebody has a facebook post that says like this is what a narcissist is in like three sentences they suddenly think they're a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and can like designate that because they saw a two second clip i'm sorry if we did that 
every single person in this world would be a narcissist because every person displays narcissistic traits at some yes. time. Every single person. It's like when I try to explain ADHD to people that don't understand it, people are like, well, I forget things too, or I get spacey. Yes. But if it doesn't impact your life on a daily basis to where it interferes with your ability to function in a harmful way to that degree, it is not a medical problem. Right. Right. And we all have moments of, or traits, I, I should say, of, yeah. of ADHD or moments where we can't focus and our brains are going a mile a minute. But for someone mm -hmm. to have to live with it every day, all day, every day, mm -hmm. that's a totally different situation and scenario. Exactly. And it's because people don't see it. And we all, you know, we all relate ourselves to other people. And that's sort of the other problem with the way that reality TV is presented is the fact that like you go into these experiences and people say like you signed up for it, but what you're signing up for it, you feel like you're saying like, yeah, well, I'm just going to be myself. So what's the worst thing that can happen? That's exactly. Because it. you don't realize that they're going to be screwing with your head, that they're going to be doing everything in their power to make you the most vulnerable possible person and version of yourself that you can be. And then use every trigger that they possibly can because they want to make entertainment. They want it to look like a sitcom or a drama looks. And yes, we all have those moments in our life, but that's not our whole lives or our whole being. And when they represent it as that, it's terrible. Like yeah. they should have a disclaimer. I'm, they have a disclaimer on law and order that says, these are not true stories. These are not real people, right? Why doesn't reality TV have that? You know, I actually had Alyssa Barmundi from Married at First Sight on the show a few weeks back, mm -hmm. and we talked about this, like, you should be viewing this like it's WWE. And why? Because WWE is sports entertainment, not a sport, because yeah. it's it's scripted. It's loosely scripted. People are playing themselves, but playing like an amped up version for dramatic effect of themselves. Yeah. And then you can't bet on it. So it's, it's similar in that aspect. This is like reality entertainment. You're not getting followed around in your everyday life. You don't even really get to pick what you do or what you talk about or what you say. And then Absolutely. they can tell and craft these stories that people watch for some reason and can't see that this isn't mm -hmm. actually real. And then they, they come at people and they hurt people yeah. and they're, they're cruel and they're mean online or they're mean in person and or whatever that is. The producers like lead that dialogue basically when they make these edits, because they, in, I mean, even in the ways they ask questions in those weekly things that you have to do, they're like, don't you feel like so-and-so is being, and then they create like, everybody's talking about her this way. So everybody jumps on board that train. Yeah. And it just becomes like this spiral of just bullying. And like, they're literally being the instigators mm -hmm. of that and just crushing people psychologically. And there are so many instances where people, you know, after these shows end up, you know, for me, I drank a little too heavily in New York. I was in my twenties, who cares? You know, people do that. It was the modeling scene and People have committed suicide. People have committed suicide. Yeah, people have committed suicide. People like my friend JL ended up with a meth addiction that she had to overcome. And then she died of breast cancer. And people suffer in like real, real ways that their lives are destroyed because they thought that they were doing something that was going to be positive. Mm -hmm. Because they went on something because of the way that it appears. And I mean, even the contracts that we signed, right? I sent mine to my lawyer um, from my accident lawyer. He was a family friend. His dad and my grandfather used to golf. That's why he handled my accident case. Mm. He was like, Brad, because he's like a dad to me. Can you look this over? He's like, don't worry about it. It's I know there's like a lot of stuff in here, but nobody's really out to like do these things. It's like when you go now to like a trampoline park and you sign this waiver, like if I break my neck, if da, 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 mm -hmm. they're just liability clauses, they mean nothing. It's because they don't want to get sued for like some accident on set or something, but then it actually happens and you're like, no, they like, yeah. they were going to do this and they wanted you to know that you were not going to do anything about it. Yeah.
and then they threaten you with it. I mean, there's literally lines in the contract for Love is Blind saying we can defame you, we can misrepresent you, you have no recourse, you can't go against the edit. If you go against the edit, it's a million dollars. There's so much Our in there. And it's wise, like five million. Jeez. And he's got five million dollars. No one. Definitely no one not I any know. reality TV show person. <laughs> yeah. No one I know. Um, what was the most alarming thing in the contract for you? <laughs> doesn't seem alarming when you first look at it like it's literally you read it over and you're like this is just a boilerplate like mm -hmm. clause the things that now bother me if i relook at it is the way that it's structured like you're actually going to like the guys and the fakeness of it of like you will be competing in a modeling competition that you will go through actual experiences of model like we didn't get any modeling training that's all a bunch of Oh, when I worked afterward, it is nothing like that. People are kind, they're caring there. I did a shoot in the French Alps. And I remember like every five minutes they were wrapping me up in a blanket and they called my agency afterward. And they're like, she was so nice. And so like apologetic for literally the weather conditions. And it's because I was so abused yeah, no by problems. top model to think that like I would be put in these situations. And I don't know if it's because Tyra, unfortunately, maybe experienced that because she was a black model at a time that that didn't exist. And maybe she was abused as well. And maybe that was her reality, but that is not the reality of what actually happens on set ever. And like the things like they make you do the nude shoot, right? And you get kicked off if you don't do it. Literally when you sign with your agency, you sign a piece of paper that's like, I'm willing to do this or I'm not willing to do this. Right. And they have no problem with it. You just decline a job. Nobody cares. It's not like this is going to be your career if right. you don't do this. Like your neck is on the line. Like there are times they're literally saying like, oh, don't take that job because we don't want you doing like a tampon commercial because you're supposed to be editorial. Right. Right. Ugh, it's just, it's not real. That's all I can, like, it is yeah, not real. And it's not. Yeah. And everyone believes it because they have Tyra's face on it and she's like a reputable person. And then nobody in middle America at like 20 years old has any idea what the industry is like. And they're just like, yeah. oh, well, that could be a way. Like, do you think Tyra knew? Or do you think that she was so high up? Because I, I actually wonder that with Nick and Vanessa. I'm like, with Nick and Vanessa, they host Love is Blind, the Lachaise. They're like the nicest people in the world. I still like, I, I hate the hate that they get, but like they weren't around that much to like really right? know. We never actually saw Tyra, right? That's okay. sort of like the same sort of thing. Like we, they make it look like she's our best friend, but we never mm -hmm. saw her unless cameras were rolling. And the second she showed up, they're like, guys, get excited. Tyra's here, everybody. And she had like on judging days, like a triple decker dot bus. I'm, but I'm sorry. Like she, I feel like she knew to a degree because there are instances where like with my weave that I had, which my scalp was infected underneath. And like, I have a conversation with her, right? I know because I was told before that by the one person that I actually trusted on the production team, the creative director, um, Jay uh, Manuel, where like I showed him my head because I was like in tears yet again, mm. because my scalp was bleeding every day Jeez. and I was in pain. And I was like the one person to get a remake over makeover because they fucked up, but they don't show Jeez. that side of it. Um, but she's like, you need to speak up. And I was like, speak up when? Like when, and I didn't say this, but like watching it back, I'm like, when did I ever see you? I have been speaking up. I've, I'm mic'd 24 seven and I'm literally yeah. crying to people. And on that subject, and I've never revealed this before because why would I? Um, so here's a really screwed up thing that happened. Uh, I had talked about having to come off pain medication in my casting mm -hmm. from my accident because I was on morphine for like three months and it, the withdrawals were painful and they were terrible. And I was in high school and I remember just suffering through that, um, like sitting on the floor of every one of my classrooms because I was going through withdrawals while trying to like attend class because I was sweating and breaking down. And 
their hairstylist on set where I was mic'd 24 seven with the camera crew, they hear everything more than once gave me Vicodin to deal with the pain. They gave you drugs. That's illegal. They wow. gave me, they literally gave me Vicodin. Like she offered it to me. Tolima wasn't working. I had no way to go see a doctor or do anything about the thing in my head. I couldn't take it out myself. It was sewn, like it was a weave sewn in. I had no idea. Um, and my head was infected and I was like, well, what else am I going to do in this situation? Like I, you didn't have a choice. Maybe it probably wasn't the best decision to accept it, but I was like, I've been given stronger medication than this. And right now I'm fucking in pain and nobody's doing anything about it. So yes, I will take that medication that is literally as a doctor explained to me heroin, and then they take carbon and add carbon and carbon and carbon and then they market it, which is why there are all the opiate lawsuits now. Um, yeah, so I was handed over and how they didn't say anything to her, how she still worked on that set every day or how they allowed it. It makes me feel like it was potentially facilitated. It wouldn't surprise me or it wouldn't surprise me if it wasn't facilitated, but then it happened and they just wanted to keep it going because they want to find ways to break you down. And they were like, oh yeah, that's going to make her way more dramatic. Let's just do yeah. that. Because right. if you've ever known, I mean, I've had friends that have overcome opiate addictions. I have friends that have, you know, I feel like being on or going through that gives you a lot of empathy for other people. Mm -hmm. um, so you sort of tend to gravitate toward trying to help people that sometimes don't have that support system. It's for them to know that history and like that being a really difficult part of a really traumatic experience in my childhood and allow it to happen and allow an illegal substance to be given to me and allow the fact that like, yeah, at the time, because it does make you more emotional when you're on a drug mm -hmm. or when you're drunk, because you're the way the brain processes things are those things that already are inhibited with things like ADHD, because it's part of the brain that like has those breaks for everybody mm -hmm. else doesn't really exist. Um, that emotional dysregulation occurs and you're like trying to stop a tractor trailer with bicycle brakes. Yeah. Right. It's just awful. Or they basically, and they're taking those bicycle brakes and they're just cutting the lines. So there's no chance. What would you like to see changed? I think that reality TV needs to be regulated. I think that, um, even on competition shows, it's clear that you're working because 90% of the time, 90% of your time there, you're not actually competing and they are profiting billions of dollars as networks, especially through syndication, through everything else. People should be told what they're signing up for, allowed to have a voice afterward. Um, allowed to have a say in what happens to them and allowed to know going into it what the reality actually is. And they should be compensated for their time and for that. And they should there should be laws against every single thing that they do that you can't do to a person in any job on this planet. Like you cannot do these things legally to another person in your household. You cannot do these things legally. Like that's domestic abuse. You cannot do these things to a worker at a company because that is abuse. You cannot do these things without being sued everywhere, but like illegal f practices and reality television. Yeah. That's, I mean, there's laws against defamation. Like that one really gets to me. There's laws against defamation, but they literally say we can defame you in the contract. Can you really sign yeah. away that right? I don't think so. Can you really sign away yeah. your, your labor rights and work 24, 20, 24 hours a day? There's a case that actually exists, um, Discovery versus London, which uh, I forget the parameters of it, but it's against Discovery TV. And whatever happened to this person, they 
talk about the contract and the fact that you cannot sign away a right to something that has not happened yet. You cannot mm. say, I give the right for this to occur to me because it is a basic human right. And it, then it becomes intentional malice. Right. What is that case called? It's uh, Discovery versus London. I'm going to have to look that up. Um, I can send you the case file for it. There was also a ruling on a Australian reality show where their um, laws around employment are similar to ours as far as independent contractors, whatever else. Uh, she was given because they ruled that she was an employee under similar mm -hmm. laws to like the AB5 things. Because guess what? When you show up on set and you're being told what to do and when to do it and you have no freedom of control. You're given things like a no compete. You can't talk to the press. You are being controlled in every aspect the way a worker is. You are an employee. Right. And with contestant shows, like they might say, oh, well, you're competing for this. I'm sorry, but part of that competition is not doing promotional shoots for you. It is not showing up and after the competition is over and having to remain sequestered and appear on set. It is not showing up to all this publicity that I'm not paid for. It is not the week and a half of shooting the opening credits or whatever else. That's nothing to do with anything. Yeah. It's not being locked in a friggin' house told that you can't walk outside and go to the grocery store or call somebody. And there's another case, which in 2002, the directors of wife swap wrote to the DIR because they were moral and ethical and business people. And what's the DAR? The DIR would be the Department of Industrial Relations in California. So it is their uh, labor board mm -hmm. from the government. And there's this letter from the labor commissioner, which responds to their um, request for information on if children working in reality television on the set of this need to follow the same protocol as children on the set of any other show. And throughout the document, in their response, it says repeatedly, it does not matter if the format is reality television. Every single law that exists as far as worker rights, even if they are being filmed in their own home because you are directing control of it, they are an employee and they must be treated with that. And that's 2002. I think that's a pretty clear stance from the labor commissioner of California that for some reason never got applied to regulation, to lawmaking, to anything else because it's been swept under the rug like everything because of these giant contracts. I mean, you look at the Me Too movement and how long that took to come out because of these contracts that just shut people up because they feel like they have no power and they are threatened. And oppressed with by financial harm, reputational harm, just who's going to take on when they've suffered like CBS corporation who yeah. has that or Netflix or exactly ABC for the bachelor crew. Nobody or... feels like they have a chance in hell. Yeah. It's awful. I think the most important thing we can do is continue to educate and mm -hmm. make sure public opinions on our side, because getting getting this in front of the right people to actually have laws put in place to have mm -hmm. unionization organization efforts, it's going to take yes, it's going to take pressure, so much pressure for them the to pressure. yeah, for them to um, not be able to just overcome it with their yeah. endless cash flow. I recently did a um, Entertainment Weekly article because I started finally being like comfortable talking about it. Um, and they did a 20 year anniversary thing on like the 20 most shocking moments from America's next top model. Cause the show is starting to even for on the screen, get recognized for some of the ways that they were not okay. What they mm -hmm. were doing that piece came out and I realized that it had been 20 years. And that journalist said to me, he was like, well, I talked to Tyra and they, um, because I brought up the three year, uh, clause in our contract, which was from the last episode of the last season of the show when it was canceled, that we were shushed. 
that we faced this penalty of like them coming after us with lawyers for $5 million, which, and they told us, they're like, we will come after you. We will come after your family. We will make sure we get our money. You do not talk. Um, so it's the mob. with that, like we finally, that period hit and we're like, yay, we're free. We can talk. Um, we can talk about this. Uh, but with that coming like to that point and him saying that they might, that like Tyra might do another season that he's talked to her, this journalist, I was like, I will, if it comes to that, be outside her house with a bullhorn just to get public attention because yeah. nobody should ever go through that again. And what disturbs me more is Ken Mock, I read, is now producing, um, or Tyra Banks, sorry, maybe it's Tyra. It's one of the two that produced our show, is producing Teen Drag Race, which, great premise for a positive thing, right? Mm -hmm. If it were actually a positive right. thing. But knowing what we went through on Top Model, to think about teenagers who are dealing with this self-identity issue, going through what they put us through, I know. and then having them gaslight people into signing up for that is sick. It's disgusting. And I, I've spoken to a few people from um, the ultimatum queer love. And mm -hmm. my, when I first saw that was going to be the season, I was like, I can't believe they're taking an already oppressed, already ridiculed, already damaged yeah community and then putting them through this and just making it the public ridicule all of it it's and just really heartbreaking they win awards because of the way they present it to the public like yep. these shows get nominated for best of this for best of that and you're like you're winning awards for abuse and torture yep. and you're literally broadcasting it to the world and nobody knows because of how manipulative you are and because of the fact that you just silence everyone yeah. through threat after threat after threat of things that no normal person would go up against after you have traumatized them. It's awful. We have to, we have to get change and we have to drive awareness. Yeah. And I know you've got your things going on. I've got my things going on. We're working together on some stuff. Um, and we will get this change. There will not, I think you're too stubborn. I know I'm too stubborn. Oh, yeah. We're not, I'm, I mean, you're still fighting the good fight 16 years later. So thank you for doing that. Um, Absolutely. We have a upcoming case with the department of labor actually. And I will repeatedly say that, uh, we don't care if it's for minimum wage, if we can get them to look at our contracts and if we can get them to designate people as employees. Yes. And I don't care if they just look at it and say like, look, this contract was illegal. This is out of the statute of limitations, but technically you were employees. You can't collect anything, but we now have to look at it. Right. Well, again, it's more eyes on it. It's more eyes mm -hmm. on it. So before, before we, we go, is there, I like to do an ask me anything at the end. Is there anything you want to ask me? Hmm. Let's see. Um, so, I mean, I asked you a lot of questions the other day. We've talked a lot yeah. about reality <laughs> television. Um, if you weren't doing this right now, what would you be doing? Oh, well, yeah, that's a great as far question. As life, as, if reality TV hadn't happened to you, well, I can tell you, I wouldn't be doing the You Can Foundation. I actually didn't even want to do it until, um, you know, a couple of weeks before we started it because this is just not for me. Like it's <clears throat> reality TV. I, I don't, I, I don't, you know, take for granted some of the good things that have come out of it. But yeah. I like to think I'd, I'd be in my career. Um, you know, my career was a huge focus for me. I was finally one of the reasons I went on the show is because I was, I finally felt like you know what, I'm where I want to be so that I can feel secure financially. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, where I would want to be. I'm actually further along in my career than I ever thought I would be. M you know, I'm ready to share my life with someone. So hopefully, um, hopefully I would, you know, still be successful in my career, um, which I lost my job in November, partially because of this shit. And so I've had a very hard time finding something new because people don't take me seriously anymore because I was on a reality show. Yeah. So I like to think I'd still have my career in place um, and maybe have 
You know, it's interesting because, you know, I want to say like maybe I would have been married or be in a serious relationship or something like that. But it's to me, sometimes it's like not healthy to to go back and think about that. And when people ask me, like, do you regret doing the show? I I say TBD because if I can, you know, use my platform to fight Mm -hmm. for other people and get change in this industry and, you know, meet people that are important to me and it become an important part of my life, then I guess that makes it worth it. But the price I feel like I've paid from a personal perspective um, in my career, in my my mental health, and I was in the best mental health space before the show I'd ever been in in my life, um, you know, which then at some point took me to the worst. And I think I would be making a difference in different ways. But, um, you know, I, I just like to think I'd, I'd have like the normal life that I spent my entire life building up towards, which is kind of sad. Yeah. This is sad. It's just, it just ruins lives. And it's interesting when you say that, because I've always said, like, I don't believe in regret because yeah. your life, if you're happy with who you are as a person right now, right, to go back and look at something that happened to you and not see that there is always a silver lining. There is always, you know, a branch of whatever, like it, my life would have been totally different. I probably wouldn't have the child that I have now who I love with all my heart had I not gotten hit by a car when I was 17 because I would have been applying to colleges. I never would have ended up on the show. I wouldn't have missed, you know, like all these things. I wouldn't have worked in service industry and then moved down here to like take care of my dad. And it's, you know, when you look at a lifeline, you can't really say like, well, if you regret that thing that actually shaped you, then it's regretting yourself. So, yeah. Well, and I, I think that's a great way to look at it, actually. I've, I've never really thought of it quite like that, um, but I, I, I'm i going to. And I want to look at it in a similar way where it's like, here I am now, and um, you know, I, I'm going to be a completely different person. I'll never be the same again. But um, you know, if I can help some other people maybe yeah. survive this, then okay. Like, I'm, I'm the, the type laws. of person. Yeah. Exactly. I'm the type of person, I guess I'll sacrifice myself for others. (laughs) One thing JL always used to say um, every day to her, she would always be like, it's the best day ever. And be like, like everything to her was the best ever, the best song ever, the best day ever. And she's like, because it's happening right now. Mm. Like you're the best person ever just for thinking that way. And thank you. And they took that person and destroyed her. That's so fucking sad. Yeah. And no responsibility for it. They don't have to take any responsibility yeah. for it. They didn't have to get her help. They didn't have to do anything. And they didn't. No, and they opted they didn't out to, to. They literally put her through hell. They put her. Um, I know this was the end, but this came up in my head. They put they made her pose dead in a grave or not dead in a grave um, as a dead body right after she like found out that her friend had OD'd. And it was the second time they've done something like that on the show. And she was traumatized. Like Jeez. 10 years later, she was still talking about it because it ruined her. It, it was the most traumatizing experience you can possibly put somebody who's grieving through. I just can't. Um, I, I know it's a system and it breeds people that do this. And it, it you know, I, I try not to hold grudges against producers and stuff like that because they're doing their job. The job sucks. I think it, it takes a crazy crazy amount of cognitive dissonance for anyone who has any humanity in them. But, um, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you sleep at night doing this to people? I have a question for you. If you've got like 15 minutes, (laughs) have you ever played the game, the cube, the cube? I don't think so. Okay. So we're going to play a game. Okay. Something I learned from a friend in New York and it has been the most brilliant thing that when you're getting to know about someone, it is something that you can use that allows them to reflect on themselves and allows you to learn a little bit about them. So I want you to imagine a desert. Okay. Tell me when you have the desert in your mind. I have it. All right. Now within that desert, I want you to imagine a cube. Imagine what the cube is made of, where it is in the desert landscape. Once you have that, let me know. I have it. All right. From there, I want you to imagine a ladder. Imagine where the ladder is in the landscape and in the desert. 
in association to the cube, how they interact or don't interact. And once you have it, let me know. Well, it's interesting you said that because I initially had a small glass cube. And then when you said ladder, I was like, maybe it's a bigger cube or maybe the ladder is next to it. So let's go with the ladders next to it laying down. Okay. Now I want you to imagine a horse. Think of how the horse is in the landscape, whether or not it interacts with the cube and the ladder and how all aspects affect each other. Last, I want you to imagine flowers. And then there's going to be one thing after this. Okay. So once you have your cube, your ladder, your horse and the flowers, let me know. I've got it. All right. Finally, I want you to imagine a storm. Think of where it is in the desert landscape um, within everything happening, how it does or does not affect the cube, the horse, the ladder, um, and the flowers. Okay. I've got it. All right. Now that you have all of that, I'm going to explain it to you. And okay. then you can decide if you want to share that um, and your assessment of that. The first thing is the cube is you. The second thing is the ladder is your friends. The third thing is the horse is your lover or relationship expectations. The flowers are your ideas and aspirations and development. And the storm is any pending trouble in your life. Wow, that's crazy. So it's all disconnected, except the flowers were in the glass cube and the storm's coming. See, and like what you when you said like your cube was first small and glass, but then it got bigger because of the ladder. Yeah, it's like you feel bigger because of your friends. So you can apply all these psychological things of how it changes right. and how everything interacts to understand your internal stuff. And I've never met anyone that like when somebody did to me, I was like, that is mind blowing. And it is the best game to play with someone. It is. And you know, what's funny is like the storm analogy. Like whenever I feel like my life is, is chaos, I have nightmares night after night after night of storms and tornadoes and lightning and flooding. And it's, so the analogy is, it's perfect. That's crazy. Were you ever in a child as like some experience of like a terrible storm that maybe cause that trigger? Um, no, not really. Um, mm -hmm. I do remember like my aunt was in a, a tornado one time and like called my mom from the, the theme park. And, and I, I remember that. And I remember like seeing their pool was destroyed by like a tree falling on it and stuff like that. But I never really experienced it. I think it's just like what it represents to me. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I was scared of tornadoes as a kid, so maybe that's part I of it, I mean, too. I think a lot of kids are afraid of things like that, like tornadoes or, like, villains or lava, because there's going to be lava everywhere all the time. Um, <laughs> hey, who didn't play the floor as lava, right, as a kid? All the time. I had footprints across, like, the dining room table where my mom would be like, who walked on my table? And I'd be like, not me. <laughs> These are none of your sibling size footprints. And I was like, it wasn't me. I don't – that's not – I terrible life. Sorry. Terrible life. <laughs> All the evidence is right there, but I'm still going to just say it's not me. <laughs> S similar to how you broke out of the house and went out when you were filming Top Model. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for coming on and most importantly, being vulnerable and sharing. I know, I know I could see it and I, I know it's not easy to do. So thank you for being vulnerable. And also thank you for what you're doing because you are also Absolutely. fighting to get changed, but where can people find you if they want to connect with you? Um, so my company into a book that does like publishing stuff like that, they can reach out to me through there. Cause it's a nice, easy thing to remember. Uh, it's just BC hatch at into a book because I've changed my name three times in my life now, um, <laughs> after Brittany and then Corinne and then, uh, writing a book, I was like, what do I use? Because marketing, let's just go with initials and, People might take you more seriously as a human being um, <laughs> and, or, you know, um, my other personal email would be chicken and mom at gmail.com. Um, so they can find me either of those places and reach out. Uh, they can find me on Facebook, Instagram. Um, I try to respond to people. I didn't for a long time respond to like anybody, but then I've I sort of felt of obligated to yeah. 
especially like when a 15 year old kid reaches out to me and they're like, oh, I loved you on the show. Da, da, da. And I'm like, that was a traumatic experience, but I'm going to be super nice to you because yeah. you're taking the time out of your day to send me a message for some reason that I, and I'm going to be kind back. Yeah, that's really nice. And we'll put all those links down in the description so you guys can check it out. But thanks again for coming on. And I look forward to taking on this fight with you. Absolutely. Hopefully it brings about the change that is needed. Couldn't agree more. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Eyes Wide Open. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is by sharing or dropping a review. For more information and content, check out engagewithnick.com or find me on Instagram at nthompson513. Don't go through life blind. Do the work so you can show up in the world with your eyes wide open.